Welcome to Neural Nebulae, where we unravel the mysteries around artificial intelligence, clear up misconceptions, and explore its transformative impact on industries, its various use cases, and important considerations you need to make as you embark on an AI journey. In today's episode, let's explore how companies across different industries can leverage generative AI today. We will dive into some interesting Gen AI use cases that we are building for customers right now. We'll talk through implementing and leveraging AWS's Gen AI suite, as well as what leaders should be thinking about when implementing generative AI into their organizations. My name is Randall Hunt. I'm VP of Strategy and Innovation at Kalent. And joining me today is Amit Singh, Global Use Case Leader for the Gen AI Partner Acceleration Team at AWS. Hey. Hey, Randall. Good to be here. Well, uh, let's get right into it. Uh, you and I have worked together now for probably two years, and uh, it's been a fun kind of uh, enjoyable set of customers and ideas throwing around. And it's been a wild ride just the last few months, I think, uh, with the release of Bedrock and all of the other tools. And uh, I wanted to talk today about how you see the industry as a whole evolving around generative AI. Uh, so could we start at maybe the, the 30,000 foot view? You know, what are you seeing out there as you talk to customers and as you talk to partners? Absolutely. Yeah. Great question. And yeah, it's been a great partnership working with you and Kaylin for a little over two years. And uh, it's awesome. Um, I would say that we have moved quite rapidly from uh, where we started with the traditional machine learning. Now that's the term, right? Traditional machine learning to generative AI in a pretty quick succession. And uh, since the announcements that uh, AWS made uh, around Bedrock, uh, announcing the preview feature uh, in April, all the way up to the GA, which uh, was like late September, uh, you have been lead, leaning in with all of the feedback and uh, partnership has been great. Uh, coming to your question, um, I do see that the, the generative AI is uh, definitely top of the mind for a lot of enterprises. Uh, this is a board level mandate uh, and it's directly coming from them through the executives and every enterprise out there in some form or the other is trying to make sense of it. It's not that everybody knows how to, uh, how to kind of approach it and how to kind of move forward with the next steps. But everyone is curious just because uh, of how fast things have moved in generative AI on the consumer side. And uh, people want to kind of take that and, and bring that experience and uh, the kind of uh, improvements in terms of productivity, improvements to customer experience that generative AI offers uh, into the enterprise. And that is what is pretty exciting. Uh, I feel like uh, there is a tremendous amount of possibility when it comes to uh, the amount of um, innovation that can happen, uh, kind of use cases that are now possible with generative AI. And then if you look at some of the reports that are being put out by firms like McKinsey and uh, Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, we are here, you're seeing some massive numbers in terms of the total addressable market uh, for with, with this technology. It's, uh, it, it's going to add trillions to the GDP. And uh, all of this is truly kind of uh, speaks to the impact that generative AI will have across the industries. It's not just one industry or the other that it is going to touch. There are use cases that will potentially get into that are cross industry in nature. There are use cases that are industry specific. Uh, while all of this is good, a lot of customers are still trying to make sense of it. Uh, many of the customers are starting with uh, uh, exploring this technology trying to understand what are the use cases that they can approach initially, a lot of them starting with internal use cases first, and then thinking about what are the use cases they can uh, take to their customers. A lot of it has to do with uh, the fact that the regulation is a bit unclear and uh, customers, particularly enterprise customers are waiting for more clarity to emerge and they wanna make sure that they understand how foundation models work uh, there is a lot of uh, talk about foundation models being a, a kind of a black box, right? So unless customers get comfortable with things like um, explainability and right, making sure that they don't 
uh, have bias creeping into their data and, and like there are some security and, and privacy concerns as well. So I think there is some of that, but everyone is uh, kind of leaning in. They want to experiment and start uh, working with this technology and, and people and customers are at different stages of uh, uh, experimenting with, uh, with generative AI. So, you know, you touched on a lot of interesting topics there, and I'd like to dive into some of them a little more deeply. But before we get into that, if you were to think of, you know, the hype cycle of technology and the evolution of technology, where would you say we are in the scale for generative AI now? Are we, you know, past the hype cycle? Is it still just getting started? Are we at the beginning? You know, where, you know, based on your career in the industry and your experience, where do you think we are on that spectrum? Yeah, I think there have been, like, if you talk to different uh, sort of individuals, you'll get different answers. In my view, uh, things have moved pretty fast in this space. And I feel like we are somewhere in the middle of people still trying to make sense of what this technology can do for them. Um, so we haven't really reached the peak of the, the hype cycle yet. Uh, I know there, there is a trough that uh, then, then happens. Uh, and then uh, the value of like despair, whatever. I mean, I, I can't recall the exact term, but uh, I think we haven't yet reached the, the peak of the hype cycle. Um, I think there is definitely a lot of interest and in people are, are, as I said, experimenting with this technology, but there are a lot more use cases, a lot more innovation to come in this space. We are just getting started. Awesome. I was reading an interview that Andy Jassy gave to the information this morning, and he said that uh, we're three steps into a marathon. And I thought that was a good quote to say how how far along we are in the, the hype cycle yeah. so far. Um, Absolutely. I think we are just getting started. It's, it's a marathon, as, as Andy said, and uh, there is a lot of ground to cover. Absolutely. So, you know, we've talked about how people are still experimenting with this enterprises, for example, and I want to dive deeper into what the ROI is of using large language models or other generative AI solutions. And, you know, where do you see that ROI coming from and what sectors of those business you mentioned a few already like uh, customer service. And uh, I, I just love to dive a little deeper and understand what you're seeing in the industry. Absolutely, great question. I think ROI is, is a great place to start. Um, I would think about ROI slightly differently in, in the case of generative AI, right? So when you kind of think about uh, ROI, you can look at it from uh, different lenses. Um, I think sometimes the return is a bit hard to quantify in a lot of scenarios, but what is unique with generative AI is the broad applicability it has across multiple use cases and, and the kind of uh, innovation it can unlock across different organizations. The way we like to talk about the impact of generative AI is across four uh, key categories, right? Number one is uh, productivity improvements it can bring to, to your own employees, to kind of enterprises, right? And, and the employees that it has. Second, uh, the kind of uh, improvements it can lead to customer experience with this technology. Third is uh, it empowers, as the name suggests, as generative AI, right? So it empowers people to create stuff and do that at a faster pace, unlocks innovation. So that's kind of the third category. And fourth, uh, enterprises can really put this technology to use in automating their own internal business processes. So if we take those four lenses in terms of the applications of generative AI more broadly, if we can quantify uh, the, the return uh, for each of these use cases, um, what we are seeing with generative AI because of broad ap applicability it has, the cost piece is, is kind of pretty, it's very powerful, right? I would say it's very much in favor of enterprises Previously, if you kind of take a step back and look at how traditional machine learning worked, right? You have to identify like, what is the business problem you're trying to solve? You have to gather the data for that business problem and go through the entire life cycle, machine learning uh, uh, kind of a development life cycle, which you're pretty familiar with, right? And try to solve for that unique use case. And, and you have to do that and repeat that same process for every single use case and there is, that is changing with generative AI because with generative AI, you can have a similar approach um, 
And then like you can basically use the same foundation model and the underlying technology to solve multitude of use cases, right? So I think cost side of things uh, from a process standpoint and like how your developers and your machine learning engineers and data scientists operate, it unlocks much more uh, value. Um, and then if you look at about where we are, uh, going back to Andy Jesse's quote, right? Uh, we are just getting started. And what we are already seeing is that the price point at which some of these services have launched, if you kind of think about uh, like how these services are, whether it is like per token pricing, or if you think about uh, like based on what you use with like, let's say Amazon SageMaker instance-based pricing, that is going to come down um, with every passing day with the amount of innovation that is happening, the amount of innovation both from Amazon and the other players, particularly with custom silicon that we are investing in, it is going to bring the price of uh, inferencing as well as training down continuously. So I see that on the cost side of things, uh, Generative AI offers a lot of value. It offers a lot more value on the return side of things as well. Um, and then to answer the second part of your question in terms of the applicability, I do see that this has, like I said, very broad applicability from a functional standpoint. So the early adoption that we are seeing of this technology is definitely pretty strong in customer service or contact center, as I said. Uh, beyond that, from a functional standpoint, I see sales, advertising and marketing, as well as human resources, legal and compliance, this technology is finding use case in all of these areas and unlocking a lot of uh, things that the employees have to do and allowing them to do it at a faster pace and do it much more accurately. All right, so definitely leading to significant productivity gains. And then if you take that one step further, uh, there are use cases within industries as well. And then some of the top industries where we are seeing uh, the innovation happen and the applicability of uh, generative AI happen are financial services, healthcare and life sciences, manufacturing and automotive. So those are, I would say, like some of the early adopters. And then I would, I would say, go as far as to say that there is no industry that is going to be left untouched with the with generative AI, media and entertainment. Right? I can go on and on. Retail. Um, consumer packaged goods, right? There is there is applicability of generative AI across all of these industries. And we are seeing use cases specific to these industries emerge where customers are investing uh, on, on the POCs as well as then kind of taking things into production as well. One of the things that you mentioned uh, earlier was the change in the cost model. So if you think about uh, traditional machine learning or even the creation of some of these foundation models being locked behind enterprise gates that have large budgets and can't afford the the margin hit of the the research and development of these situations uh to your point you know it's really difficult for a smaller company or an incumbent to go and compete with those enterprises who have the very large budgets but one of the things that i particularly like about bedrock is the democratization of access to these models you pay per token um, and, you know, th there's a, a margin associated with the per token cost. And I don't think anyone is is angry about that. That makes sense just from a business perspective. But then you also spoke about the custom silicon, which is something that we've helped uh, a couple of customers take advantage of so far, particularly running the Llama 2 models on Inferentia. So uh, we were able to get... Uh, if you if you take the hourly cost, because Bedrock, you I like to think of it as serverless inference, basically, is you're paying a input token and an output token cost. And then you think about running SageMaker or EC2 with the custom silicon. Those I think of more as the hourly cost, but you can still work backwards from that hourly cost to a per token cost if you look at the uh, max throughput. So for batch workloads, we found for batch inference workloads, we found with Llama to a 7 billion parameter model on an M2X large, we could get down to, you know, micro cents per token, basically. It was it was a huge, huge uh, savings for one of our customers. And, uh, you know, the m 248 x large instances have also been very fun to play with because the throughput that we get with those is exceptional. So um, with continuous batching and other techniques, we've, we've seen peaks of up to 1,000 tokens per second on some of these, which is just... Uh, really, really f 
cool to imagine, you know, you don't need an H100, you, you don't need a $50,000 GPU to go and like get these great performance numbers. You can do it on this custom silicon. Um, and that's all powered by the, the Neuron SDK. So we've helped a number of customers take uh, fine-tuned versions of their large language models and uh, translate those using the Neuron SDK to work on that silicon and, and use the optimized hardware. Uh, I think that work has been very rewarding for Kalent, but I'm also really excited to see the uh, the work with Anthropic that was just announced in the investment, because I think that is going to continue to feed the development of additional custom silicon. Uh, you know, if Anthropic is going to be leveraging uh, Inferentia and Tranium more, that'll help the whole community that's building on top of these things. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. And I think it's a really a, a great move on Amazon's part. Um, Absolutely. I think you said it really well, right? I mean, if you think about what Amazon has put out there in terms of all the different tools and options, whether it is like custom silicon or tools like Amazon Bedrock and Amazon StageMaker, we are providing a lot more choice and, and like the, the all the different types of foundation models that are available. We are providing all of this choice to customers and uh, they can decide how they want to use these uh, building blocks, right? Um, that meet their performance requirements, that meet their uh, cost or pricing requirements, right? And then uh, latency requirements, right? All of that, I mean, in accuracy, whatever, like all of these different security, whatever the constraints or requirements that kind of enterprises have, we are offering all of these different tools that, that kind of touch upon different aspects. If you want uh, token-based pricing, right? Go and use Amazon Bedrock. Uh, and want a serverless experience, Bedrock is, is the right tool for you. If you want more control over your infrastructure, right? Uh, you, you use Amazon SageMaker and you go to like instance-based pricing in terms of whatever you use per hour. And all of that is pretty competitive in terms of the pricing that we have we are offering. And as you know, with Amazon uh, and AWS things in terms of pricing, we, we have kind of reduced pricing significantly since, since like EC2 was launched. I don't know how many times, I think probably 90 plus times. I'll have to kind of go back and check the exact number. But you, you can expect more of this to happen from AWS in future. Yeah, I, I absolutely do. And I, I'm excited to see, you know, as the unit economics of these situations improve, I, Amazon's always been very good at passing those savings on to the customer. Uh, and I, I would, I only expect that trend to continue. The, um, the a rapidly evolving sort of, architecture that we're seeing is that a lot of the initial ingest and embeddings of documents into kind of a vector storage, we've seen that uh, where customers are doing it sort of on a cron job basis or maybe a nightly job. They'll spin those instances up on Inferentia and SageMaker and run the embed and ingest job, push all of that into the data store, but then the actual day-to-day -day inference and retrieval they end up doing that um, uh, using Bedrock and some combination of whatever embedding model they used, whether it was Hugging Face or uh, one of the others. Um, the there's there's interesting things still, I think, uh, around how you can scale these things and what the combination of things will be over time. I'm interested to see the evolution of provision throughput within Bedrock as well. Uh, I think. You know, right now the provision throughput pricing is is set aside for people who are really seriously going to be using Bedrock like very heavily. I, I'm interested to see how that evolves over time and becomes a little more accessible to to other use cases. Um, I, I have I, I had the the pleasure of running into some of the Bedrock team up in Palo Alto recently and. Uh, I won't. I won't say anything here, but I'm very excited about their roadmap and and all of the things that are planned over the next few years. Um, I think Bedrock is a really strong platform to build on, and you know, even at Kalent, we've we've kind of started this hashtag build on Bedrock movement, where we're just kind of building all of our fundamental generative AI applications on top of Bedrock because we see it as this expanding platform and suite of generative AI related services that we can take advantage of. Um, and then, Absolutely. yeah, I think there is a lot of, a uh, lot of, there are a lot of good things to come uh, from, uh, from Bedrock. Like I said, we are just getting started. Provision throughput. I, I was also like positively surprised by 
after seeing the pricing that was put out uh, when when Bedrock went GA. And Provision Drupal, you're right. I think it's uh, one of the, like, uh, uh, I would say unique things in terms of how we are kind of thinking about pricing overall uh, for Bedrock. But, and, and like, yeah, we are happy to go into the details, probably not in, in a forum like this, but given a specific customer opportunity and all, we can absolutely get into the details of that. Yeah, and I absolutely think it's going to evolve. Like, I, I think this is the initial sort of opening, and then we'll see how things improve over the next, you know, six months, one year, like, you know, three steps into a marathon. This is only the beginning, and I think there's a lot of really exciting things happening. So you mentioned... Um, financial services as a customer. And I wanted to share one example that we've had at Kalen. Um, I have to be a little cagey on who the customer is, but uh, imagine that they are uh, processing payments for, uh, uh, you, you know, B2B buying, essentially. So we're able to use the Titan models actually to create uh, a natural language interface over their DDL, their SQL. So they can query their underlying data store um, using the Titan models. And you just embed in the context of the prompt, the description of the tables, and then it'll generate a SQL query and you can retrieve the results from that SQL query, which uh, makes it a lot easier for them to do some of their business intelligence and other workloads. And then there's another customer that I'm really, really excited about that we're working with right now. Uh, and what they do is they process large volumes of emails and translate the unstructured content of the email into uh, structured JSON. And we found that by providing a simple pattern uh, for the type of email that's being processed, so say that it is... Um, uh, you know, a, a travel email from Delta, for example, and you want to parse the, the email and turn it into JSON with the updated gate information or uh, the ticket information, you know, we've been able to see really, really great results with Anthropic Cloud V2 uh, through Bedrock on that one. And, uh, I, you know, if you think about the way you did this in the past, it would take hundreds of thousands of lines of regular expressions to go through and you know, people would be afraid to touch that code. And it's all written in, in regular expressions, which is basically the equivalent of holding the shift key and rolling your face across the keyboard. And this is hard to maintain, whereas a call to this model uh, is much easier to maintain. It's just one line of code compared to 50,000. And I, I think our customers are very excited about the efficiency gains that that brings, not just in terms of adaptability, to uh, taking in net new information and uh, net new unstructured data, but also in terms of maintenance, it takes fewer, it takes less effort uh, from a coding perspective to maintain these calls to these generative AI models than it does to maintain this complex parsing logic. So that's one of the other things that we've seen that we're very excited about. Um, so I, I wanted to pivot our conversation uh, you know, I, I want to keep the ROI of, of these applications in mind, but I also want to kind of come back and say, you talk with a lot of customers, you talk with a lot of partners. I'm curious, what are some organizational considerations that leaders, you know, the C-suite, how should they be thinking about these things? Uh, what, what are the kind of pillars that they need to be evaluating their generative AI strategy around? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So, um, by the way, on the uh, the use case that you mentioned, we uh, that's probably one of the very like most popular use cases, uh, and that can easily be extended to like a lot of different industries. Like being able to use natural language to query your own databases, you can set like controls like in terms of accesses and all. I mean, uh, based on the role and you whatever. But I think that's a very powerful use case because now. What you're doing effectively is reducing the dependency that you have on programmers or like people who know SQL or like who are on the database side of things, uh, who are familiar with your data warehouse and all that. And you're really empowering your um, business users, right, to be able to kind of query your data as needed, right? Salespeople can query the CRM with natural language. Human resources can query the employee data with natural language. So I think that's a pretty powerful use case that can be extended across different functions and different industries. 
Coming to specific organizational con uh, considerations uh, in terms of how, what, what enterprises are thinking about uh, and how they should be actually approaching generative AI, what, what I'm seeing based on my customer conversations is that uh, there is a mix of enthusiasm and uh, a bit of uh, concern as well, right? So enterprises are taking uh, a very guarded approach to generative AI. I think one thing I would say is uh, involve the right partner upfront and someone who can really help you explore and uh, kind of uh, narrow down onto the use cases, first of all, that enterprises should be exploring. Then get into the conversation around uh, the investment, right? What type of investment are the enterprises ready to make? And we can go down the line. I think we just had a discussion, right? Uh, you can explore with different uh, kind of ways of doing generative AI, right? Or different sets of architectures. Like you can just uh, maybe solve your use case with prompt engineering. You, If that doesn't solve, maybe try retrieval augmented generation, right? If that still doesn't solve your use case and not hitting the right accuracy levels, maybe then go down to fine tuning. And if you're still not getting the results, maybe I think you, you are one of those customers who really need to uh, pre-train a foundational model from scratch. Of course, you need to have the right level of expertise um, in your in your team, people who who have the research background, right? And you need to have the the right amount of data to be able to pre-train a foundation model. So you can go down this path, uh, and then like you know all the different nuances within fine tuning. Um, there are some more cost-effective ways of doing 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 fine tuning, and there are like more. Uh, cost prohibitive, but probably offering more value when it comes to. So plan your investment accordingly. That would be the second step. Uh, go down this type of value chain. Uh, don't don't go to fine tuning directly if your use case doesn't warrant that, right? Uh, that's kind of the second step. The third step I would say is uh, for enterprises, they should be thinking about getting their workforces ready, right? And this applies to both the technical as well as uh, business audience, right? So make sure that you're on the business side, your employees understand the value uh, that generative AI can bring and how they can uh, harness generative AI to solve their, their business challenges. I'm seeing a lot of uh, enterprises are running hackathons with a mix of business and technical users and really empowering them to maybe just kind of starting with an overview of what generative AI is and what it can do, but then letting the employees explore uh, what are the kind of use cases that are possible for their enterprises? What would add value for them? So, so think about getting your workforce ready on the business side, make sure that they understand the value and what are the different use cases that are possible. On the technical side, make sure that you have the right technical expertise. And if not, then, and then think about how you can engage the right kind of partners to help you uh, along the journey. Um, I think there are new type of uh, functions or what do you call uh, roles or job families emerging. I think prompt engineering is, is one of those. Um, you need uh, a little bit of different kind of expertise here uh, than I think a traditional data science background uh, to do things like um, retrieval augmented generation and, and kind of prompt engineering. Definitely focus on your data strategy. I think that's a that's a core pillar when it comes to thinking about like uh, your entire uh, like what are the kind of use cases that are possible with generative AI. Make sure that you have a good data strategy in place to to be able to address those use cases. The other thing I would say in terms of like for enterprises is they need to be thinking about protecting their business. So while it is important to think about uh, all the different cool things that generative they can do with generative AI, uh, different ways in which they can improve customer experiences and uh, improve employee productivity, uh, first thing that enterprises, a lot of them care about is how they do not run into the trouble, right? So get your legal uh, and, and kind of risk department involved early on make sure that they are comfortable with the kind of use cases you're planning to invest in or explore, and they sign off on those. Um, and then you're comfortable with the technology that you're going to use, and you understand the pros and cons of, of what you're getting into. So I would say those are like uh, three or four high-level considerations that uh, enterprises should be paying attention to when they're thinking about adopting generative AI. 
I like that. I, I think the, the hackathon that you're talking about is very valuable. I think one of the things that we've seen is that people see the new technology and it feels overwhelming to get started with it. Uh, but once they are kind of hands on keyboard with it and they are moving forward with it, they, you know, it's off to the races. Everyone is coming up with new ideas. They see the power of it. I, I just, I don't know all the time how to entice people to take that first step of actually using the technology and getting their hands on the keyboard with it. So I, I like the idea of a hackathon for that. That's a great, uh, uh, way of getting things started. And we've, um, We've run a couple of things internally that I, I wouldn't call full scale hackathons, but are certainly, uh, you know, uh, internal sprints and things like that, where we've helped build out a couple of uh, internal features. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to mention is uh, we've actually started leveraging Bedrock internally for a number of different use cases. So we have uh, a internal, let's say, knowledge base. Uh, we call it the Kalent way and it's, 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 or the part shelf. And it's where we have templates, common cloud formation templates or common Terraform templates that we reuse across, uh, different kinds of, uh, you know, common scenarios. So setting up a cognito user pool or, uh, you know, an API gateway with, you know, this level of auth, that sort of stuff. Uh, we built a retrieval augmented generation knowledge base powered by cloud V2 on top of that. Uh, but additionally, what we do is we stream all of the changes to that into uh, a kind of a change log file. And then we have Bedrock go and, and parse that change log and then generate a weekly summary of, hey, here's all the things that got updated this week. And so just this morning, I saw it go out um, in our Slack channel and it was it was cool to see. And then people are asking, oh, how is that built? And I think that you know, also inspires employees to go and learn how this technology works. So having the internal use starting and having people actually start using it, I also think can inspire people within your organization to go out and learn more about it. Absolutely. I completely agree with it. And this is like eating your dog food, right? And this is something that like we do all the time at uh, Amazon and AWS. Um, I can give you a couple of examples on our side, right? We are using Amazon Bedrock to actually go through all of the different uh, opportunities. Uh, and there are a ton of those, uh, not giving the exact numbers, but we, we have seen uh, a lot of opportunities uh, emerge and we are going through that data using Bedrock and uh, we have identified like, what are the top use cases that we are seeing in terms of like, uh, the journey so far, right? Uh, and we we have a good sense of that. I mean, Amazon Bedrock has been pretty good uh, with identifying uh, what those uh, top use cases are based on the analysis of all those opportunities uh, from within uh, within the CRM. And uh, we can get down to the level of detail in terms of uh, not just the top use cases, but what are the use cases by industry? But what are the use cases by different customer segment types, right? And you can access all of this data through natural language, right? So that's one, one good example. The other one is uh, like we have teams across um, AWS and Amazon utilizing uh, Code Whisperer, right? Amazon Code Whisperer. I mean, by the way, developer productivity is another great area where you see like uh, a lot of adoption and innovation already happening uh, and significant productivity gains for, for developers and software engineering teams. So a lot of internal Amazon teams are using the technology that uh, we are putting out there for our customers to use. And as you probably know, we just announced a feature where uh, customers can actually augment uh, the capabilities of Amazon Code Whisperer by bringing their own uh, like code base, right? And, and get even more, uh, even kind of better results in terms of the kind of coding output that Code Whisperer suggests. So yes, we are absolutely doing that. That's one of the best ways I would say that uh, enterprise get started. I know there is a bit of uh, apprehension with, when it comes to kind of legal and, and security concerns in terms of adopting generative AI. But uh, if you start with an internal use case, expose your employees Knowledge base is a great way to get started, right? Expose your internal employees to the kind of productivity gains that they can have by adopting generative AI. And once they know what, what generative AI can do for them, I'm sure they will, they will organically come up with the use cases that 
can you best serve the enterprise? And we've been using Code Whisper internally quite a bit as well. And uh, I, I love it. I, I think I use it every day. Um, maybe <laughs> uh, there is one bug that I'm very tired of, which is if I have a comma at the end of a string, it still puts another comma at the end of that string. And I've, you know, I don't, I don't want to start anything, but fix the commas. That's my request. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I'm sure you'll provide good feedback. <laughs> but uh, I think, you know, every sort of code completion agent has those common problems all the way back to IntelliSense, you know, from from the early 2000s with uh, Visual Studio. Um, well, we've, we've chatted about quite a few things here. And uh, I want to close by saying and, and retouching on this point that you made earlier, which is... The foundation of any of these customizations or the foundation of any of the utility of these models comes back to the data. And that's something that we've seen uh, play out across our customers is that we will start out using, you know, a traditional foundation model with no fine tuning or, and very little prompt engineering. Uh, but as we get deeper and deeper into these use cases, it turns out that uh, the underlying data that we are either querying or using to potentially fine tune or enhance the model, it's not necessarily in the right shape. And we've seen use cases where we've actually been able to use Gen of AI to catalog and enhance this data and even improve the shape of the data so that it is better suited for querying. And I think that's one of the the nice drivers and, and ancillary benefits that we've seen of Gen of AI so far is that it is making organizations that previously relied very heavily on manual work to keep their data in shape, to come back to looking at the foundation of their database and their data warehouses and data lakes and looking at that situation and understanding, okay, well, we need to improve this in order to be able to serve the level of inference that we would like. Have you seen that as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so like a lot of people assume that generative AI is this new technology and they, it will solve all of their problems and uh, like meet all of their business use cases. But uh, ultimately, like with anything related to AI and machine learning, you know, right, data is the starting point. Uh, data is, the, is, 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 is a core asset that enterprises have. And uh, the more qualitative data that you have, the better your results will be. Uh, whether you are using generative AI or not, right? I think, and particularly more relevant if you are kind of thinking about using uh, generative AI, right? Whether it is like retrieval augmented generation or, or like most of the common architectures uh, and the applications of generative AI, they start with your own data. I think prompt engineering is good, but those are probably for very generic type of use cases, right? You want to kind of get into the state where your the model is hallucinating and you're exposing your business to the risk. Uh, you want to control that, and that control will come from uh, the kind of data that enterprises have. So absolutely, I, I completely agree with you that data strategy and uh, is, is kind of at the core of this, and uh, data is an asset. Whether you are actually looking to do simple things, right, just like creating a knowledge base or like a chatbot or virtual assistant uh, or even kind of applying that to your uh, context and transformation type of use cases, or you're thinking about actually being a little bit more transformational and thinking about monetizing that data with creating the right kind of data and generative AI products and releasing those out there in the market. We are seeing customers who do that, uh, a lot of industry adoption that is happening. Uh, I think general purpose models or these foundation models are great. But then I think the next evolution that we'll see and start is already happening with like one of the large uh, financial services data provider. They used Amazon SageMaker and they released their own foundation model uh, trained on their own kind of proprietary data as well as the internet data. And it's very well suited for uh, financial services use cases. We have uh, this thing happening in, in the legal domain. We have the innovation happening in healthcare and life sciences. So we'll see continuous adoption of uh, foundation models uh, that are fine-tuned or kind of geared towards specific industries and domains. And all of that is only possible with, with data. And, and then if you get into the next phase of pre-training your own foundation model, 
you need uh, a huge amount of data to be able to kind of do that. And then where we are seeing customers is not only the data strategy is important, and you need to focus more on the value added aspects of uh, how you ingest data and how you maintain the pipeline, because not all the aspects of um, data ingestion and maintenance strategy are as important. So focus more on the value added aspects. Think about your data in terms of what are the maximum number of use cases it can unlock. Right, so, so keep that in mind, but also thinking a little bit more transformationally, think about how you can apply generative AI and use your data as an asset to create data products and, and, and kind of experiment with new models out there, right? New business models, not, not like, I mean, traditional machine learning model, but more of like how you can transform your business with the kind of data that you have and the amount of innovation that is now possible with generative AI. Well said. I agree. Uh, it, it it also changes the unit economics of operating virtually any business because you now have this capability. So I, I like bringing it back to the business level objectives and saying, okay, well, how do we actually get this, you know, providing value for us? Um, well, uh, I have really enjoyed chatting with you today. You you and I speak all the time offline and, and mostly on Slack and and mostly, you know, sending back quotes back and forth from different, uh, articles and things. But, uh, I'm curious, you know, to close us out, could you tell us a few places people can go if they want to get started with generative AI and what are some of the AWS resources that are available? Absolutely. I think we have a ton of resources available. Um, you can start with some of the training resources that are available on uh, skill builder. Uh, if, if you're kind of wanting to learn about different uh, services that we have to offer, right? Uh, we have a lot of different uh, recordings that are available there. Bedrock is GA, so I would suggest that uh, Code Whisperer is GA, right? So best place to, to learn is like start using these things, right? We have uh, made the, the services available in, in different types of formats, right? So you can use the Playground if you are more of a business user. You can use also the like the APIs if you if that's what like if you're more in the developer realm. So I would say start using these services. There is a free version of Amazon Code Whisperer available. You can start experimenting with that, um, and then connect with your account managers if you want to kind of learn deep uh, deeply about any specific topic. Uh, we have a ton of resources internally. Uh, any topic, any area that you want to explore. And then I would say connect with uh, with with our partner community. I think they have a lot of deep expertise, uh, whether it is like expertise in the generative AI and machine learning area, or expertise in specific domains, or uh, having kind of worked with um, customers of certain types or solved business problems that you're trying to kind of uh, solve for your enterprise. So I would say those are the areas I would. Um, really point you to in terms of exploring. There are a ton of resources available and um, like we are always looking forward to kind of helping our customers adopt this new technology and unlock value for their business. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, at Kalen.com, we also have a number of different resources related to generative AI. So you can read our blog where we've posted recently about the uh, uh, building generative AI applications on top of AWS. We've uh, done a deep dive on Bedrock and walked through the API shapes of all the different models. And uh, we will be publishing a lot more uh, over the coming weeks. We'll make sure to link to all of Amit's uh, links that he's just mentioned here in uh, the notes of whatever platform you're watching this on. But with that said, I'm just gonna kind of close us out here and say that uh, this concludes our episode of Neural Nebulae, and we hope you have something to think about as you pursue innovation with generative AI. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and review on the platform that you're listening on, and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks again, Amit, for, for coming, and uh, can't wait to chat with yeah. you again. Thanks, Randall. It was great talking to you.